Daniel Dennett is Austin B. Fletcher Professor of Philosophy at Tufts University. His books include Consciousness Explained, Darwin's Dangerous Idea, and Freedom Evolves. I interviewed him at his home in Massachusetts. Okay, well, first of all, Dan, thanks for taking the time. You're welcome. Um, I, uh, I'm looking forward to talking about consciousness and evolution and free will, each of which you've devoted uh, at least a book to. Um, I wanted to start off, though, with uh, this, this crusade you've gotten involved with lately on behalf of a group called Brights. Mm -hmm. Interesting use of the word crusade. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, a lot of people are doing it these days. Yes. <laughs> Sometimes it's ill-advised. Yes. In this context, I think it's, it's fairly harmless. But um, the, the um, uh, Brights in, in, this, in this context are not smart people, but it's a term that's now being used uh, to refer to people who reject supernatural explanations. That's right. And I guess loosely speaking, you could say that they tend to be either agnostics or atheists. Yeah, that's right. And, um, and, and you, you've said, uh, quote, the time has come for us brights to come out of the closet um, and, and to demand bright rights. Um, so for starters, uh, I'll let you come out of the closet as clearly as possible. Would you call yourself an atheist or an agnostic? Well, I don't like the term atheist because it usually means somebody who's going around upbraiding people and trying to force them to listen to his arguments for why there is no God. I don't think there's a God, so I'm an atheist, but I don't, I don't make a deal of it. I think it, it, it's not that I passionately believe there is no God. It's that, of course, there isn't a God, but so what? So, it, so the difference in your mind is not one of how confident you are that there's not a God. I mean, you're a hundred percent sure there's not a God. A hundred percent? Am I a hundred percent sure of anything? Okay. I'm as sure of it as I am of anything. Yeah, I guess. Okay. Uh, the but not a hundred percent. I mean, the reason I right. ask is because that that version of atheism has always struck me as, in some technical sense, logically indefensible. Right? I mean, you can't prove a negative. Right. I think it was Bertrand Russell once said uh, he couldn't prove that there was not a teapot orbiting Mars. Right. So he's a teapot agnostic. I'm a teapot agnostic with regard to God, too. I suppose. I can't prove that God doesn't exist. Right. And what, what are you... For one thing, the reason I can't prove that is that apparently no two people mean the same thing by God. Right. And... Some people, what they mean by God is nature. Well, that exists, and they just they, they worship nature. Right. Mm, so do I, in a way. Does that mean I believe nature is God? Well, who knows? Yeah. Um, uh, it's not supernatural. Okay. It's uh, wonderful as all get out, but it isn't supernatural. Okay. And do you do you feel you're missing anything? Um, I mean, do, do you wish? Do you wish you could believe in God? Is there no. no void in your life? No. Uh, in fact, I think, I think that's actually a much more interesting question for most, to ask most people, or actually it's hard to ask them because they don't want to answer it. Uh, uh, I am feeling that not that many people actually believe in God. Many people believe in belief in God. That is, they think it's a good thing, and they either... They try to believe in God. They hope they could believe in God. They wish they could believe in God. And they say they believe in God. They, they go through all emotions. They, they try very hard to be devout. And sometimes they succeed. And for periods of their lives, they actually do, in some sense, believe that there's a God. And they think they're the better for it. Um, otherwise, they behave like people who probably don't believe in God. Very few people behave as if they really believe in God. A lot of people behave as if they believe they should believe in God. Well, how would you behave if you believed in God? You would perhaps, I mean, and some people do this, uh, be prepared to take what other people would call, call suicidal risks because you believe God is going to be there to save you. Uh, you would be prepared to... Uh, 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 give away everything that you own because God commanded you to do it, and so forth. Well, yeah, although there you're actually talking about a specific conception of God. Yeah, right. Any conception right. of God that would make you think you could take risks without fear of death. No. Um, and, and I guess that, that's... Well, that's, that's one of the problems with belief in God is that it is so 
amorphous and undefined. It's not oh, like well, believing no, in helium or believing. What I'm saying is there can be different definitions. Oh, it may sure. also be amorphous, but I, but I'm just referring to the problem of there being sure different, many different definitions. Right. So. The, the um, but along those lines, are you? You're rejecting also the idea of kind of higher purpose of any kind. Uh, higher than our purposes? Yes. 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 Yeah. Okay. And um, on the question of evolution, I think um, you, I think you and I agree that evolution has, in a certain probabilistic sense, a kind of direction. That is to say, natural selection, once it acquired much momentum, was likely to produce um, diverse forms of life, increasingly yep. complex life, yep. and even properties like intelligence yes. were not at all unlikely, even if it, even if there was no predicting which lineage would lead to them and so on. Yeah. So you do believe evolution was kind of headed somewhere. Um, yeah, headed somewhere. But not by design. But not by design, and uh, uh, not guaranteed to get there in any finite stretch of time. Well, right. Yeah, bad uh, things can happen. My... my uh, uh, favorite image of this is um, if you think of uh, going up being the sort of rise in complexity up to intelligence and so forth. Yes, this is what we've seen, but of course at any moment it could just crash. Sure. But then it would go up again right. and crash and go up again and we'd have a sort of sawtooth. But yes, that the trend is in some sense, up that there is a progress in design. Yes, absolutely. Okay. And um, is it inconceivable to you that, I mean, you can imagine how someone could have a strictly materialist conception of natural selection as I do, believe in the directionality that we just discussed mm -hmm. as I do, um, and still think that it's uh, possible that there is some larger purpose unfolding or that, that natural selection actually was the product of design. I mean, you can imagine being basically a materialist and still thinking that it's subordinate, uh, natural selection subordinate to some larger purpose we don't understand. There actually was a designer of natural selection in some sense. Uh, uh, yes, I can, I can imagine that in some loose sense. Okay. I don't know that that's a coherent idea, but it's not obviously incoherent. And you certainly don't buy it in any event. I don't buy it. No. Okay. Um, let me suggest that there's actually ways you could appraise that hypothesis. In other words, sure. there could be evidence for it or evidence against it. Yeah. And, and let me... There could. Le, I agree. Le, okay. Le, let me, let me um, be clear that I'm using design in a very loose sense. But I, I, think, uh, I think you and I would agree that you can speak of individual organisms as being designed, at least in quotes, oh, yeah. by a, by, but not by an intelligent being, by a process of natural Absolutely. selection. Absolutely, yes. And that process imbues them with uh, what you might call purpose or goals. Absolutely. It, 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 but they, as they real act, as purpose could ever be. You mean getting genes into the next generation? Yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. okay. That's the criterion of their design. Yeah. Now, there's a, uh, a famous... Uh, Episode in intellectual history that that was uh, that, that that inspired Richard Dawkins to call his book *The Blind Watchmaker*, involving this long dead uh, theologian William Paley. Mm -hmm. What happened was he argued. He said, "Look, you can you can look at living forms and tell that there's a god. It's like if you if you're walking through a field, you pick up a watch. Obviously, it was designed to do something. That's it's yep. functionally integrated and so on." He said. You look, look at the uh, animals. It's the same way. You can, you can yeah. tell there's a god. Now, I agree. agree. He was right that there had to be a process of design, right? Absolutely right. Okay. Now, here's among the things that I think you would agree uh, are evidence in favor of that that hypothesis. If you watch uh, an animal um, grow from a, a single germ cell, there's a directional growth toward functional integration at higher and higher levels of organization? Mm, um, and, uh, well, maybe. I won't, I mean, I'm not quite sure I like that way of putting it, but, but um, I think I see what you're getting at. Okay. I mean, there is that, as a matter of fact. You do observe that in the life of an organism, and we actually Well, know you know, you have many more brain cells before you're born than you do shortly thereafter. There's a tremendous pruning. Is your brain more complex 
before you're born or after you're born. Development is not all in the direction of greater integration or greater, or greater complexity. In well, some regards, in some regards, it's well, simplification. Much greater, much greater functional differentiation. Much greater functional differentiation, and, 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 and integration, and correspondingly functional integration of, of differentiated things. Yeah, sure. Um, and it gets bigger, and it develops a nervous system and so on, yeah. and, uh, these coherent functional things. Yeah. Um, I would submit that if you step back and observed uh, life on this planet in time lapse, including not just the, the evolution of human beings, but the cultural, te including technological evolution mm -hmm. that led to where mm -hmm. we are today, mm -hmm. um, the, the, uh, the process would look remarkably like that. Um, and in fact, you, you, um, you yourself in, in your most recent book, I noticed, uh, Freedom, uh, Freedom Evolves, um, you say uh, there's a sentence something like the planet is finally growing its own nervous system us mm -hmm. and it's true i mean it looks like that right yeah, and, and there absolutely. is a functionality yeah, about yeah. it and you agree there's been a directionality about it yes. so it seems to me that to the extent that's the case uh th that argues um maybe strongly maybe tentatively maybe barely who knows but but that is some evidence in favor of the hy the hypothesis that natural selection in some sense, is, is, is a product of design, in some sense may have a purpose. No, I don't think that's a good argument. I think, I think it's, that remains an open possibility, but I don't think that the evidence that we have before us gives us any particular reason to think that it's more likely than not. Since the, the alternative hypothesis, namely that uh, natural selection happens because it can happen, and that's it not because it was supposed to happen and not because there's a purpose to it. It happens because it can, and since it can happen, all of the design accrual that is the mark of natural selection happens. It happens. That's all you can say. Well, it certainly follows that it will happen if you have self-replicating yeah, material yeah, yeah. Um, and finite resources yeah. and so on. Um, but. A, it didn't have to be the case that there was that on this planet. In fact, it's still a little yeah. bit of a mystery how it came to be. B, all I'm really saying is, look, you can imagine natural selection uh, unfolding. Um, you know, it, I mean, uh, Stephen Jay Gould could have been right. It, it, it could be directionless and aimless, and, 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 and 99 times out of 100, nothing intelligent evolves, nothing complex evolves. But I'm saying that, uh, and, and if you compare that scenario with, with the alternative, which you and I both believe, that there actually is a probabilistic direction toward complexity and intelligence. I don't think that's inconsistent with, with the claim you just made that 99 times out of 100, 90, nothing, nothing intelligent evolves. Well, that, That's probably true, too. Well, but you agree that there is a probabilistic direction. I thought you said earlier, actually, it was... It was likely to lead to greater complexity and intelligence. No, over the long, long, long run. Well, that's yes. what I mean. But I mean, in the same way that uh, most of the organisms that have ever lived on this planet died childless, and most of the lineages that have ever started off are extinct, right. and so much more than 99 out of 100 of the lineages that have ever uh, evolved have extinguish themselves without ever leading to intelligence. Well, well, so intelligence well, is, sure. is, the, is the rare thing. Yes, but it's still, it's, you have enough time, it's very sure. likely to be created. But I mean, I, I think that works in, in, in favor of the argument I'm making. I mean, first you said, you said tons of organisms die childless. Right, and yet you agree that they were designed by natural selection to, uh, to create to offspring. Childless, yes. The fact that some of them don't yep. do it, does it does it yeah. rule out that possibility? Secondly, the fact that lineages go extinct. Well, that's true um, in epigenesis as well. If you look at the sure. the cells that that you started out with, tons of them go extinct. And and what goes on inside your body is in, is more like a process of natural selection oh, than a lot of people realize. Yeah. And one thing it has in common with natural selection is that although certain properties are very likely, I was very likely to wind up with eyesight, eyeballs. Um, it, it wasn't at all inevitable which of my stem cells would be the grandfather of the lineage that led to the eyesight. And that's also right. true of yeah. natural selection. So uh, I just think that to the extent, I mean, I think we've agreed that, that, that observing 
what is it, ontogeny, I guess is the term, or, you know, development of an mm-hmm. organism. Um, <clears throat> that does, it has its, its directional movement toward functionality by design, and that's, in fact, a hallmark mm-hmm. of design. Mm-hmm. Would you agree that to the extent that natural, that evolution on this planet turned out to have comparable properties, that would work at least to some extent in favor of the hypothesis of design? Mm. Um, to some extent, to any extent. Yeah, I guess. Yeah. Okay, yeah. I'll declare yeah. victory and go. Okay. Now we can talk about something else. Okay. Uh, because after that, it yeah. at least becomes an empirical question and, and something you can argue sure. about. Sure, yeah. Um, unfortunately, we only have one case to study, whereas when you're looking at individual animals, you can you have yeah. many more. Um, your, your book on free will, um, the the... You're framing uh, the issue of free will in a very, what will strike most people as an unusual way. People usually think of free will as opposed to determinism. Mm -hmm. Of course, by determinism, we mean the idea that basically the rest of, the future of this universe is inevitable because the universe is this mechanistic thing. It works according to rules. And in principle, if you understood everything about the state of the universe and everything about the rules that govern it, you could predict what happens tomorrow, and that includes people's brains. They're deterministic, yep. and so free yep. will is kind of an illusion because of determinism, because of the truth of determinism. That's the argument, traditional argument against That's free will. That's the traditional argument, yes. You're saying, I think you're saying that actually the two are compatible in some meaningful sense of both terms. Absolutely compatible, okay. yes. Right. So I'm just a compatibilist. There have been compatibilists for hundreds of years. Um, but I'm a little different from most of the earlier compatibilists in that I want to deny flat out a premise that you started with, that you mentioned yourself just a minute ago. You said the future is inevitable if determinism is true. Uh, first of all, I want to say that phrase, the future is inevitable, just doesn't mean anything. Um, we, we can't talk. The future, the future is going to happen, uh, whatever it is. And that's true whether determinism is true or indeterminism is true. There's going to be a future. Now, in what sense could you talk about the future being inevitable? I don't know. What we have to talk about is particular events being inevitable and or particular types of events. And in order to see what the word inevitable means, you have to take it apart. And oddly enough, although the word trips off the tongue of everybody who writes about free will and determinism, uh, hardly anybody's ever looked at it. But, of course, what it means is unavoidable. I mean, evitable, inevitable, avoidable, unavoidable. That's all the word means. But now, to avoid something, this is something that an agent does, an avoider. You don't, so, mean, you don't mean a literary agent here. No, I mean... I mean like Although a, sometimes they, they avoid. Sometimes they avoid. <laughs> no, I didn't have literary agents in my... I had... Uh, or secret agents, uh, although those are both agents. Uh, I mean agent in the broad sense of being uh, an actor that has some sensory capacities and some goals and that acts in the world to uh, accomplish its ends. Okay. Um, now, are there agents that can avoid things? Sure. Tons of them. And in fact, the reason you have to look at free will from an evolutionary point of view is that's remarkable. That, that there are agents that avoid things is a remarkable fact. And there's many more avoiders now than there used to be. And they're much better at avoiding than they used to be. And in fact, uh, it's as good as, as a definition of intelligence to be uh, an expert avoider, to be able to foresee far into the future to see things coming down the pike and to take steps in a timely way to prevent those bad things from happen, happening and in order to foster things that you want to happen. Uh, uh, we don't have a, a good uh, parallel word. Uh, what would it be? Enhancer? Uh, uh, probabilifier? Um, uh, there's, there's no... Uh, uh, we avoid harm what, and, we, and we try to get the good. Um, but uh, but there isn't a, a single verb for, for what we do with regard to good things the way there is for avoiding the mm-hmm. bad. But now, that means that the whole concept of inevitability gets its meaning from the perspective in which 
a perspective in which there are agents, in which there are agents that might want to avoid something. And it might be in their power or it might not. Now, there's, if we start looking at particular worlds with particular agents and particular circumstances in them, we can now start saying, well, in this world, what things are avoidable? What kinds of things are avoidable by this agent given its powers and its circumstances? And the answer may be, well, if you throw a brick at it, it can duck because uh, uh, there's enough light so it'll be able to see the brick and its nervous system is good enough and its reflexes are fast enough so that it's pretty good at avoiding bricks. However, a random lightning bolt is no good at avoiding those. You know, it's just doomed. If if there's a lightning stroke coming up in its future, it's it's toast. There's nothing it can do about that. But if you if you try, uh, uh, you know, to throw a spear at it or something, your chances of, of succeeding are, are, are next to nil because it's such a good spear avoider. Now, in order to be able to talk this way, in order to partition the universe into the things that are inevitable for that or agent or evitable by that agent, uh, we have to have a way of talking about evitability and inevitability in a, in a deterministic world. Now, since there's plenty of evitability in deterministic worlds that we can define. The implication, you know, determinism implies inevitability is just false. It's just a mistake. And so it's thousands of years old. It's not been pointed out. It's just a mistake. So natural selection creates harm avoiders. It's, uh, natural selection is an explosion of evitability. We've had huge increases in the degrees of freedom. Mm -hmm. The powers that the products of evolution have, the accrued powers, uh, this is one of the most obvious facts in the physical world. Mm -hmm. It's this growth of evitability. Now, now, if evitability, if you look at evitability in that way, then you see that just the, the, the traditional philosopher's notion of inevitability just isn't in the same picture. And, and you can say that we are future alterers, at least in the sense that, had we not evolved the capacities we have for harm avoidance, yeah. the future would have been otherwise. And, yeah. and you have to be very careful when you talk about future alterers. Right. Because what are you going to change the future? From what to what? <laughs> Since it hasn't happened. But you can talk about yeah. what it would have been had I not evolved my That's uh, right. yeah. whatever it yeah. is yeah. I yeah. use to avoid harm. Um, but, of course, the reply you get from people is, Yes, but you're still saying that given the fact that I have evolved these things, given the condition in which I wake up this morning yep. and the way my brain is inclined to use these things, yep. the future is inevitable. And my feeling that I, that, that I need to, well, you, you certainly hear this as a reply. You right? certainly do, but, but I'm going to say, what on earth do you mean my future is inevitable? Well, but that again, if you knew that an omniscient being could predict what's going to happen today and there's no possibility that I will behave in a way that's going to change, that's going to, make, that's going to falsify that prediction. That's what people mean. Well, first of all, that would be true, if I understand you right, in an indeterministic universe too. Well, no, in that universe, the omniscient well, being would, would, take, would do the calculation and go, I think this is going to happen, but... Whoa, Caprice enters the picture magically. No, the, om the omniscient being is going to know the future. Well, no, omniscient about the present, I mean, and the laws that govern the present. So okay. you mean a Laplacean being? Yeah, a Laplacean yeah, calculator. And then, but lo and behold, uh, T plus one after the prediction is made, Caprice enters the picture from we know not yeah. where. That's the traditional conception of free will. And, and, and people have to let that's go of a, that. That's a traditional conception of free will. Right. And what I'm arguing is that it's, uh, it's gratuitous. It, it does not... The motivation people have imagined for it is simply mistaken. Allowing for quantum indeterminacy, or shall we call it Laplacian indeterminacy, does not give you any more powers, any more freedom, any more avoidability, any more evitability than you have in a deterministic world. It's just an illusion to think that it does. 
Okay. You say in the book that, and this is maybe one example, but uh, that uh, free will lacks the tra your conception of the kind of free will that's viable uh, lacks some of the traditional properties mm -hmm. associated with free will. Have we yep. already covered all the traditional properties, or are there other things people are going to have to let go of? Um, I, I'll let other people make that calculation. I've tried, I mean, what, what I claim is that all the varieties of free will that are worth wanting, we can have in a deterministic world. That the, I can define varieties of free will that are incompatible with determinism, but they're pointless. They, they don't. They don't give you anything that matters. They don't give you. They they aren't needed for moral responsibility. They aren't needed to give your life meaning. They they are completely gratuitous. Uh, they're sort of bizarre metaphysical conceits. They don't pull their weight. You don't need them. Who cares? Yeah. I mean, I have to admit, I've never been able to clearly conceive a free will, even though it feels like I have it. Uh, but yeah. but if you try to draw a graph of it, you'll run into trouble. I mean, I can imagine. Determinism, I can imagine a determined system. I can kind of imagine a random one, although that's actually harder than it seems. Um, but, but free will is, is a slightly fuzzy concept. Um, on the issue of quantum physics, though, I, I, uh, I wanted to raise it like a, a kind of a, a, a second um, uh, dimension of quantum physics that, that, might, that might enter the picture. I, I, as I understand um, what you're saying about quantum physics and free will is, is you're kind of saying, I mean, first we should say that according to quantum physics, there, there is such a thing as truly True. indeterminate. Yep. Uh, at the quantum level, very microscopic level, things happen that you could not in principle predict, even if you had all the information in the physical universe. That's right. Uh, as, as Richard Feynman put it, nature herself does not know what she is going to do next yep. at the quantum level. And some people have tried to use that to bring free will into the picture because mm -hmm. it is anti-deterministic. I think I agree with you that, look, lots of random fluctuations, even in the brain, if they're truly random, don't amount to what people usually mean by free will. Good. So we don't need randomness, or at least randomness can't give us free will. If it's true randomness, you would think not. On the other mm -hmm. hand, I would say one thing about quantum physics is um, you can't really know if random is the right word if you don't know what's causing the thing. I mean... Well, no, but that's what random means in quantum physics. No hidden variables. Uh... Well, no hidden variables in the physical universe, right? But, yeah. but, but um, let me put it another way. I mean, in, in the quantum world, events happen for which there is no cause in the physical universe. I mean, right? which is kind of weird. But, 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 but let me bring up a, a different weird aspect of quantum physics that may bear on free will. Um, the, uh, it's this business of the idea that the process of measurement or observation brings... Uh, quantum reality into definite existence. Okay, that that this is one interpretive. We're already getting an yeah. interpretive yeah, part of quantum say, physics, yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, but, but Collapse are, of the wave packet. Right. Yes. There are reputable physicists who who say this, and there are two different ways to put it. One is that uh, it's just that the, the quantum uh, a quantum particle or whatever encounters a macroscopic measuring device, and that alone causes it to assume finite form. But some serious physicists think, no, you actually need a, like a conscious being observing the measuring device to bring the thing into mm -hmm. uh, reality. Now, if uh, into fixed, uh, finite reality, if they're right, that would seem to me to open up the possibility of free will in a different sense. I mean, what they're, what they're saying is that there's something you know, we don't entirely understand about uh, sentient being. I mean, yes, yes, I can see where you're going. Okay. And and uh, um, by by wedding two bits of magic together, you're going to say it's not magic. By letting consciousness be a sort of mysterious and magical property, and saying that qu uh, uh, quantum uh, enlargement, in effect, depends on consciousness. Uh, you nicely tie together two uh, two themes, uh, and I think uh, uh, they're both. Uh, this is just magical thinking, and we and there's no reason to believe believe either side of it. Okay. That is that is. <coughs> it's important to your view, as you just put it, that there be something really perplexing and mysterious about about sentience, about consciousness. 
And uh, I, of course, uh, deny that. Yeah. yeah, okay. Well, I'm uh, okay. We've gotten to the part of the discussion where I'm afraid we, <coughs> we have to talk about consciousness. No, I'm afraid I, so. I always prefer to avoid this because you can, you can talk about it for a long time without making any progress. It's that kind of subject. But uh, since we do disagree about it, maybe we'll, we'll generate heat, if not light. Mm -hmm. um, and w what you've just alluded to, uh, you just um, kind of called me a, a Mysterian. Uh, and in any event, you called me that in your last book, so mm. so so it's an official uh, yeah, yeah. it's an official allegation, yeah. which I actually uh, don't really deny. I mean, a mysterian in this context, uh, at least as I understand it, is somebody who believes that consciousness is really mysterious. Now, first of all, by consciousness, I, I think we both mean basically sentience, subjective experience. So if I say I feel pain, that was the mm -hmm. feeling was part of consciousness. I see the color blue, that seeing, the experience yep. of seeing that. And similarly, if you say, I think lizards feel pain, then you're attributing consciousness to lizards, okay? Yeah. Um, I do believe it's mysterious in a, in a couple of, of senses. There, there, there are, although I think science can tell us a lot about it, um, I think there are some fundamental questions about it that science may uh, never answer. Um, you... Uh, you think consciousness is more like just a puzzle. There are pieces to be worked out, detail, details yeah, to be yeah. worked out, but we get the big picture. Now, let me, um, let me try to characterize your, what you mean by consciousness, and you stop me when I start getting it wrong. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> I think you know where that will be. Mm -hmm. um, the, the, uh, okay. You believe that the consciousness is a brain state, or is the brain, or is the state of the brain. Uh, and you don't just mean consciousness can be explained in terms of the state of the brain. Um, I mean, I, I, I believe that, or at least I assume that. I don't really know what to think about consciousness. But I, 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 it's certainly plausible to me that whenever I feel pain, you could point to the part of the brain that's causing that feeling. Whenever I see something, you could... So that I could map my consciousness one-to-one -one onto my brain functioning. Okay, but that's not all you mean. When you say consciousness is the brain, you don't just mean consciousness is explicable in terms of the brain, right? You, you um, uh, I mean, one, one way you commonly hear this is, uh, in other words, you're not just saying that, that well, let me stop there. Have, have, I gotten, have I gotten it right so far? Um, actually, you've, you've, you've put it in a slightly more extreme form than, than I myself would. All, uh, that is, a, uh, that is a, 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 a more simplified materialism than my own. Um, when I say that um, uh, uh, my favorite metaphor these days is the fame in the brain or cerebral celebrity theory, it's, that is that what, what consciousness is is the relative political influence or fame of structures in the brain that uh, win out in competition against rival structures for domination of the brain's activities in various ways. That's putting it uh, uh, very programmatically. But basically it's saying that in your head there's a sort of turmoil going on, the pandemonium, and there's many different contentful events vying for king of the mountain, okay. vying for control. Okay. And the ones that win, and the, by default, something always wins uh, when, you're, when you're awake, and that's what you're conscious of. And it's not that when it wins, then consciousness happens, or it, you know, it kindles some further thing that's conscious. That's just what consciousness is. It's not as if an extra process has to happen. Winning, that's it. And then the next one that wins, then it's conscious. So, for instance, a robot that instantiated this sort of competition in its brain would be conscious. Um, Absolutely. Well, but we can build robots now that do these kinds of things, that have competition among theories about the world. Are you saying they're conscious? Um, they're, they have the right sort of competitive structure but there isn't the complexity there. I suppose in a little way they're conscious, but, but, but not in a very interesting way. It's the right sort of thing. So yeah. there may be conscious computers right now, according to your view. There, there, you say you suppose there well, are, so there probably are conscious computers. In, in the sense that 
extremely rudimentary versions of the architecture that I say consciousness is exist. That's true. Well, but, in but, the, in the sense but that, I mean, you're saying it's true. Then I mean, you're yeah. saying according to your conception of what consciousness is, there are now conscious machines in the world. Except that I, when I talk about consciousness, first of all, I talk about human consciousness, and I think human consciousness is very different from all other animal consciousness. Sure. And the the level of complexity, just the just the informational uh, right. breadth right. of of the architecture uh, uh, of human consciousness is enormous, and a a toy model of that. Mm -hmm because it's a toy model, in a certain sense, isn't really an instantiation of consciousness. Mm -hmm. But if, if it could be scaled up, the answer would be yes. If it could be scaled up, but yeah. It then, but it hasn't been scaled up. So, no, it hasn't. So there aren't conscious right. computers. There aren't right now. You're sure but there that. could be. That, th this leads yeah, there to really could be, yes. Sure. There may be. Sure, in the future. Oh. See, I, I, I mean, I'm sure there aren't now because I know the state of robotics research and I know the state of AI research. But and the, and some people are on the right track, and you know, give them give them enough money and time, and yeah, there will be okay. conscious robots. Yeah, no, I don't, I don't, I don't rule yeah. out the possible. And let me say yeah. that uh, you're th this this idea of com kind of competing, uh, you know, competition within the brain and the winner uh, is conscious. I, I would certainly. Uh, agree that that could be the way that uh, consciousness is shaped. But I would say that's the way the brain generates consciousness, and I think you would object to that. Yeah, it's, the, it, it's it, that last yeah. step where you have to turn on the right. magic projector and have this extra state created somewhere else. That's no, it's what not we created don't... somewhere else, it's created in the brain. Well, but, 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 but it's that's... different from... I mean, yeah. let, let me... Um, See, that's, that's where you're asking for there to be an extra shine or something that just doesn't need to okay, exist. Okay, well, uh, we should bring in another term to make clear what you're not. Uh, uh, it, the term is epiphenomenalist. An epiphenomenalist view of consciousness is that consciousness is generated by the brain, uh, so the brain influences consciousness, but consciousness does not in turn influence anything. the brain. So it's anything. Like, doesn't anything. Anything. Right. right. But it, it, and that it, is one of the, I mean, to this day, I, I am flabbergasted that anybody takes this view seriously. Right. That's not your view. And, it certainly is. Let me isn't. just go on. I mean, epiphenomenalism is like. It's insane. So consciousness is to the brain the way a shadow is to my no, hands as I move No. My hand. No. No, that's what epiphenomenalism is. Ah, thank you. That's what people think epiphenomenalism is, and it's not. Your shadow is perfectly visible. You can rec it, it has lots of effects well, okay, in the that, world. That part breaks down. It has lots of effects in the world. There's a perfectly right. innocent I, notion I of epiphenomenalism. I understand that, but, but as my hand moves along, the shadow does not in turn affect my hand. It's a, it's, I mean, you see, it is a limited yeah. analogy, but the point is, it is consciousness a, it is, is a limited and very influenced by the brain, but does not in turn influence the brain. That is epiphenomenalism. Well, but... And you are not an epiphenomenalist. Right, because that's because right, right. because epiphenomenalism is exactly as absurd as the following view. Are you ready? Okay. Um, in every cylinder of every internal combustion engine, there are seven epiphenomenal gremlins. They're caused by the action of the cylinder. They cause nothing in turn. They are undetectable by any machine, by any test. There couldn't be a gremlinometer. Mm -hmm. They don't add to the horsepower. They don't add to the weight. They don't add to the mass. They are completely so what epiphenomenal. You, what bothers you is that, that in this view, in the epiphenomenalist view, consciousness cannot be detected. No, that's that's the mistake. Because if that were true, then you wouldn't be an epiphenomenalist. Because if the fact that you're now telling me that you detect your consciousness is an effect of your detecting it, then you're detecting it is an effect of the epiphenomenon, and well, that's ruled out by definition. Well, that's the now, trouble. Now you've gotten it. That's an interesting. That's thing the trouble that with epiphenomenalism is it's an that's, incoherent well, that, view. Okay, okay but it, but but here's the interesting thing. I've thought about this a lot lately. <laughs> that in the human species, I mean, even if you're an epiphenomenalist in in this sense, okay, you think when pain, subjective pain, arose in a lizard or in a worm or whatever. Okay, let's go back millions and millions of years in natural selection. Subjective experience arose as an epiphenomenon, okay, 
Uh, and you can imagine that, right? You can imagine that a no, worm I has can't. an epiphenomenal consciousness. No, I can't. I, Why not? Because, because, I'll say it again slower, I guess, the, the very concept of epiphenomenalism, of effects that have no effects, yeah. is completely unmotivatable. Always, always, always. What does that mean? It means... You agree, I think, that the view that there are seven epiphenomenal gremlins in every cylinder is, is a view that is not to be taken seriously, right? I, it doesn't seem likely to be true to me. Well, compare it with the, that there's six epiphenomenal gremlins, or three, Equally or seven. Equally implausible. Not just implausible. Right. It's defined in such a way that you could never well, possibly is, have any reason to assert it's it. Not a, so it's not amenable to scientific analysis. No, no, no. It's, it's worse than that. It's, it's, it's trivial in a certain way. There could be no motivation for asserting it. If the engine said, I've got gremlins, I'd start taking it seriously. And that's what happens. Uh, if the engine said, I've got gremlins, one thing you would know is it couldn't be saying this because it had gremlins. Because if there were gremlins, <laughs> they wouldn't be causing it to say it because that would be no, a that would be a death that, that would is, be a, a contradiction point. your <laughs> your critique of epiphenomenalism does become relevant when you have organisms talking about their consciousness yeah. but tell me how it doesn't make sense in an earthworm or a lizard i i say look the lizard okay it 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 it's, it sticks out its paw in into a fire yeah. and it retracts the paw. Yeah. Now it feels pain at that moment, and I think the pain is an epiphenomenon because what's really happening functionally that gets it to retract mm. its paw is this physical information mm. goes up and down, blah blah blah. Its feeling of pain is a kind of shadow of that. Now uh, why could that uh, not uh, be the case? Don't don't get into grimoires. Just tell me in the case of the lizard, where is the logical contradiction there? Well. Because we don't know what you mean by by its feeling pain in addition to the events going on. Well, Maybe you know it what just pain is. Feels like. uh, I, assume, certain, I assume lizards, certain, if if they feel pain, and you you believe yes. some non-human animals feel pain, yeah. feel something like it feels us. Okay. But so, but I mean, that doesn't get us. We can't know. But but that doesn't get us to epiphenomenalism. It just gets us to sensation. Well, right. But and, we're talking and, about a sensation that I'm positing is an epiphenomenon. Well, but. That's what we don't know what that means yet. We, we do know what epiphenomena means. Well, it is well, caused by, but does not in turn influence. Well, but let's then, let's then note that if it doesn't influence anything, right. then it doesn't influence the lizard. Right. So it doesn't, for instance, cause the lizard to believe it has pain. No, lizards don't think about that kind no, of thing. No, and so, in fact, the lizard is completely clueless with regard it it is That's it is the, the lizard, lizard and the lizard the lizard's own mental state is precisely as if it didn't have a sensation of pain no its mental oh. state is not well now you're then you're contradicting yourself no its but, mental state is the consciousness of course it's well, consciousness but now is you're influence. you're just you're, no, well oh no. but now you're just helping yourself to dualism well epiphenomenalism is a kind of dualism it's just well, not an interactionist the, well, I, I mean, look, the, 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 the causality moves in one, one direction well, with but, epiphenomenalism. Mm. I mean, where is the contradiction right. in the case of a lizard? It's true that once you get p humans, in humans, consciousness does start influencing things, like it's the reason we're having this conversation. And that's an interesting fact. But if you go back earlier in evolutionary time, an epiphenomenalist yeah. view of consciousness has, uh, yeah. is a coherent concept. And, and the fact that a consciousness that's originally epiphenomenal might later have an effect is an, is an interesting fact with philosophical significance. Well, I suppose it's also a coherent concept that, um, uh, that the pebbles on the beach feel, they're, 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 they, they sense the gravity. Hmm? They they have this. I don't this know. I feeling. doubt they do. But 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 the thing about you think that do you think that's that's a, a serious. I call that highly, highly unlikely. But, Just but, highly but, but, unlikely? Gotta, but, but the whole thing about consciousness is, and, and this is where, you know, the, the thing about consciousness, it's one of those questions where two people disagree. It isn't just they disagree. They don't even understand each other. And, and this is where, this is a difference between you and people like me who have an alternative view. 
To us, an essential feature of consciousness is that no one other than the conscious being can ever verify the consciousness. If it's you an inherently private state. And that's one reason science may never penetrate right, it. Right, science right. studies publicly observable yeah. things. If you define consciousness that way, then you get your conclusion in a single step, right? Science can't study it. But let me show you how I can define something the same way, too, which science can't study. And, and you tell me how your view differs. Um, you know how um, naive Americans, are, they go to Europe and they ask how much something costs and they're told so many euros. And they say, well, how much is that in real money? That is to say, in dollars. And they think, well, you know, dollars, there's a sense in which dollars have value in which euros and you know Swiss francs and so forth don't really. I mean, they have relative value, relative to dollars, but dollars have intrinsic value. Now, we say, no, no, dollars don't have intrinsic value. It's just the exchange for goods and services. It's not as if dollars have an intrinsic value that, that yen or euros don't have. And they say, no, no, I define the vis of a dollar as its intrinsic value. And I submit that economic theory cannot ever explain the intrinsic value of a dollar. And they're right. By definition, the intrinsic value of a dollar is something which is forever outside the purview of, of economics. The thing is, there's no reason to believe that dollars have intrinsic value. The fact that somebody in their gut has this deep-seated intuition that dollars have intrinsic value, well, that's an interesting fact about them, but it's nothing that science has to maybe explain why they have that weird hunch. But they don't have to explain the intrinsic value of a dollar because there isn't any intrinsic value to a dollar. And similarly, I take on the burden of explaining why you have the intuition that you have that this is what consciousness is. And I think I can give a pretty good explanation of why it seems that way to you. But it's, you're just wrong. No, I don't want to hear that. I, want to I hear know that you don't. <laughs> I mean, and, and no, no, that's with, but, with, with, with but, a dollar. I mean, the, the um, you, you, but in you, any event, why? I mean, I mean, there is an explanation about dollars, but let's not get into that. And why some people are confused about dollars, the relevance of that to your claim <laughs> confused about consciousness is something I'm not completely clear on. But let me, um, let me. Let me just tell you some things that you've said about consciousness that strike me as getting at the difference in the way we look at it. Okay. Uh, you've written that a chess playing computer is, quote, manifestly not a conscious or self conscious agent, unquote. How could you know for sure? I don't think they are conscious. I mean, I don't know. I doubt it. But, but how could you know for sure that? There is th that that a computer is not having an internal subjective experience. Well, because I have a view of consciousness as playing an important role, and I know everything that's playing an important role in that in that chess playing computer, and there's nothing that's remotely like consciousness. Here's something it can't do. Let me, I'll give you a very simple thing. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a joke line, a tagline. Well, it seemed like a good idea at the time. Right, you've, you've heard that line. Well, it seemed like a good idea at the time. Rueful reflection of person who's just come a cropper in some way. Mm -hmm. Now, I think that's actually a wonderful thing to be able to say and mean. If you can say and mean, well, it seemed like a good idea at the time. That means that you can recall how it seemed then, and recall how it seemed, and you can compare it to what you know now. Now, that's a level of self-knowledge and reflection and knowledge of your own past and of your own past thinking that's really potent. It's, it's, it's the key to debugging. It's the key to improving, to self-improvement. Sure. And it's functional. It's functional. That's a really big, important functionality. Right. Test plan computers don't have it. Okay, well, neither do lizards. If it's they did... Yeah. Then they would have. The then, then I wouldn't be confident that they weren't conscious. Okay, fine. Then they would have the experience of ruefulness, but and but, of but, being able to reflect on uh, their past. I mean, past lizards thoughts. presumably don't have ruefulness either. But but That's you right. agree that lizards may experience pain. So why? In one sense, I mean, and I mean, in one sense, I, no. I, that is that is. I think it's. Say, I actually don't agree to any sort of categorical statement like that because I don't think you or I have 
figured out what we jointly mean by that. I think, well, I think this is one of the problems that people have with consciousness, is that they, they point to, they allude to supposed sensations, and they think they know what they mean. The famous phrase, what is it like to be a right, bat? Thomas Nagel's phrase. And I don't think, I think in spite of the popularity of that phrase, mm -hmm. it is, it's a wild card. It, people don't know what they are agreeing to when they agree about the question that what we're going to talk about is what is it like to be a bat. Okay, but leave aside the details of what it's like to be something. You agree that it is like something to be you, right? Yeah. And that means you're conscious. Yeah. Okay. Um, so that seems like a good working definition. And it leads me to, to something else you've written that, that points to kind of this difference of worldview. You write, quote, Nagel claims that no amount of third person knowledge could tell us what it is like to be a bat. And I flatly deny that claim. Mm -hmm. Now, you, you think that there is some amount of scientific study of bats and echolocation and everything mm -hmm. else that could lead me to know exactly what it's like mm -hmm. to be a bat? Yeah. To know it fully? Yeah, as much, well, fully. Um, well, maybe we diminishing you diminishing returns. It. Okay, so you can never know exactly, you well, agree you can never know exactly what it's like to be a bat. I never, you can never know exactly everything about a grain of sand. Well, in principle, That's the only, you could. In no, principle, well, everything, everything, everything? Uh, from the, you know, everything about that grain of sand, from the Big Bang to the heat death of the universe. Oh, the whole history of it? That's in principle, every... in principle yeah. yes, you could follow the molecules. Mm. Um, okay, then in principle you could know everything it's like to be a bat. But you realize why most people think you just couldn't. I, 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 mean, I mean... I realize that many people think you just couldn't. But I think that's a I think that's a shibboleth. I don't think that's I think that's an but, intuition but I mean, a, which is which is uh, honored by tradition, but has nothing much going for it. But you agree that I can never know really what it's like to be Dan Dennett. No, right? I don't agree with that. You think I can know fully, thoroughly exactly what it's like to be you? In principle, sure. And what would that consist of? Me reading a lot of your descriptions of your well, because I mean, if I, if if there were some yeah. machine that could magically transport me into your frame of reference so long as I felt like me looking at the world through your frame of reference you through your you know perceptual lenses I I wouldn't know what it was like to be you that would be like me you know I mean yeah. then, and that and that's why a lot of us think consciousness is this inherently private thing that is well, just well, not amenable to scientific analysis yeah, in the way that a grain of sand the thing about a grain of sand whatever it, the extent to which we can know it, you and I can know it equally. Okay, yeah, yeah. that's not true of your consciousness. Well, it's it's um, uh, it's circumstantially true that I know a lot more about what it's like to meet me than you do because I hang around with me all the time. And I'll uh, go further than that and say you are. You well, um, no. In fact, there's uh, that. That's not the point. The point is that uh, uh, somebody. Else, you know, my wife say, can know things about what it, what it's like to be me, that would never occur to me to reflect on. But she's right, I'm sure. And and uh, if this is a horrible thought, if a team of observers, they didn't just wire up my brain, but they hung around and asked me questions and watched and saw how I reacted to everything. And they were to study me much more intensively than I could ever study myself. They'd know more about what it's like to be me than I did. They could write. They could write a. They could. They could write a, a better uh, encyclopedia of what it's like to be Dan Dennett than I could. Well. And they'd be getting at the innermost me. Now, well, they now the idea. The idea that you just can't do that. Mm -hmm. Well, so people say, but I'm not. I just don't believe it. Now they could describe patterns in your behavior you're not aware of, even internal dynamics you're not aware of. But yeah. they could never know what it's like to be you the way you can know what it's like to be you. Says you. Yeah. Um, but 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 I I don't I don't take that as an axiom. I don't take that as as a premise, and I think that that the fact that philosophers in the past have tended to do that. Is is a fascinating 
fact, but but it doesn't persuade me that they were right. Let me let me. This is a final a final quote of yours that I'll try to um, to throw in your face and and um, defy you to justify having. So far, I've failed uh, to get you to capitulate, and I don't I don't think this is going to work either. To be perfectly honest, but uh, this is, you're talking about Mysterians. Mm -hmm. Some Romantics, the philosopher Owen Flanagan calls them the new Mysterians, and as you subsequently said, I am kind of a mysterian, have advanced the claim that there is an insurmountable barrier to the brain's understanding of its own organization. Mm -hmm. No, that's not what I believe. I believe I can understand my brain's physical organization completely, and I can understand your brain's physical organization completely in principle. Mm -hmm. I believe that consciousness is something more than the physical organization of the brain. And again, I'm not saying that the physical organization of the brain doesn't account completely mm. for subjective experience. I'm just saying subjective experience is not the same. And, and we've already kind of established oh, I, I, We can I, look at the organization of your brain. I, Everyone yeah. can gather around and look at it. We yeah. would not know what it's like to be you after we had well, done that. There's a passage in your book where you say um, that the, the more uh, Dennett and others um, say that consciousness is just an event going on in the brain, the more I come to realize that what they're really saying is that consciousness doesn't exist. Yeah, I, it's a footnote of, of my book. It's, it's a in, footnote. It's in non-zero, but, yeah. um, but it's, it's true that when I read quotes like the one I just read, where you, where you seem to equate knowing about the consciousness of a being with knowing the organization of its brain, uh, that I, I do start suspecting that. And, and you say things like consciousness is, you've said things to me like consciousness is the brain, well, or consciousness is the state of the brain. Well, if consciousness is the state of the brain, why come up with another word for it? I mean, I, I think we can talk about the state of my, the engine of my car, and I don't, and given, and, and if you said, well, let's use the word consciousness <laughs> to mean that, I'd say, what do we need with a new word? I mean, it's... We reinvent words for states and powers all the time. Uh, Fine, but if you think you're not yeah, adding yeah. any meaning, I see. Oh well, we're certainly we're adding meaning because it's it's the it's the functionality and the organization of all of those states that makes the difference. And we can we can talk about which events you're conscious of and which you're not. Of course, we can say what difference that makes. We can talk about the 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 efficacy, the functional roles that conscious events play that unconscious events don't. There's a, a there's a lot of it's a very useful term. If you understand, if you don't define it in such a way that you you whisk it off the stage of functionality altogether. Right, but but when you say we talk about the the roles consciousness plays, the things consciousness does, you believe that in all those cases you could just substitute the workings of the brain and have the same statement, right? It's just like life. I can talk about what life is on the planet, what life enables on the planet, and what the difference is between being alive and dead. But in every case, I could get rid of the word alive and just talk in terms of the functioning of the metabolism of the cells and the, and the, and the unity of the, of the operations of the, uh, of the, you know, the coherence of the operations of self-preservation and so forth. And life isn't some other thing. It's not something over and above all those functional details. And I'm saying consciousness is just like life. Well, that's what I, when I say it boils down to the question of whether you consider consciousness publicly observable or inherently private phenomena, that's kind of what divides us on this, and, and you and a lot of people. I mean, it, Well, it, I, I think it's, it, I mean, it's this, not normally publicly observable in, in, in the same way that, that uh, let's say, that the metabolism of a person is... How, a lot of that's private too, but 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 you can you can get out your your no, but your you can in principle look at it. Yeah, yeah. You, you know, and that's and, and and you say you know there are lots of states of things that we give new words to. Yes, but in all of those cases, no one disputes that in principle it's publicly observable. In yeah. this case, tons of people dispute that consciousness is publicly observable. Well, all right, and but... that's kind of the crux, and and uh, it's why um, as is happening here, people who disagree fail to persuade each other. They just have a yeah, fundamentally yeah. different, it's almost at an intuitive level. So, um, so you want to call it a truth? Uh, Probably we should call it a truth to talk about something else. Something yeah. else. Um, do you, um, 
Do you manage to be a good person? Um, I think I'm. In your, in I your, think I'm. In your objective, you know, judgment. But I mean, like all the children in Lake Wobegon, I think I'm above average yeah. in, in morality. Well, congratulations! <laughs> Ab- above average for for a bright or for a, or for no for. Uh, 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 You're about an I don't, I, I uh, you know, there's the things I've done that are wrong. I've got my little bits of guilty conscience, but I don't think I've done anything very, very bad. And I, I think I've done a lot of good. I, I, I guess the question is, you, you don't see belief in God or, or even belief in, in any kind of higher power or even a belief in a transcendent foundation for morality. You don't, you don't see any of that. That's really necessary well, as, far as, as far as creating good behavior. Goes. Let's talk about transcendent Uh-oh. and morality. Um, one of the things that we have evolved to discover on this planet is arithmetic. We didn't invent it. We didn't make it. We found it. Mm-hmm. It is eternal, a priori, true. It's, it's just great stuff. And it's true everywhere in the universe. It's true everywhere in any universe. There's only one arithmetic. Now, is that is that transcendent? I would say, yeah. That's I don't know for sure what you mean so by it's transcendent. So kind of like a platonic thing that was it's sort of there. yeah. It's this sort of Platonism, and, and, and uh, we I mean, uh, happened upon its truth. We've we've discovered it, and it's true. Now, could there be a sort of similarly Platonic ethics? Could we find the the universal principles of good behavior for intelligent beings. I'm agnostic about that. I don't see why we couldn't. I don't see that that the parochialism of of our concerns uh, would necessarily stand in the way of I mean we can we can ask we can ask the same question about ethics that we ask about arithmetic. If we went to another planet, if if the search for intelligent Life, extraterrestrial life that was intelligence. If this, if this paid off, um, if we discovered another civilization somewhere, in, you know, in the galaxy that was intelligent, what would that share with us? What well, would certainly share arithmetic? Maybe not base ten arithmetic. That's that's anybody's mm-hmm. guess. Uh, it might be base twelve or base sixteen or base eight. Who knows? Um, that's an accident, but it would still be arithmetic. Now we can say and. Would it share ethical principles with us? And I think, in some regards, yes, it would. I now, does that make those principles transcendent? Yeah. It's not. It's not might makes right, and it's not. This is what our grandfathers did, so this is what we're going to do. It's not just historical accident. I think that there could be a truly universal basis for ethics. You mean that to get to, to a point where any species could pr- produce these great kind of collective products, which technologies and things are, they would have to come up with rules of the road for, for collaborative, cooperative sure, interaction. Sure. Okay, and is that... Um, it's, like, it's like the evolution of cooperation. Right, yeah. very, very much. Yeah. And, and uh, I mean, you could almost say that it's, it's like a, I don't know... Um, and, uh, and and I talked about this with Steve Pinker a little too, who who um, who discusses it in um, I think one of his books. The the um, I don't know if he used the phrase strange attractor, but it's kind of like it's kind of like a, a, a truth that's out there. It's an attractor. That, that yeah, yeah. Certain kinds of evolution are going to happen mm-hmm. upon when they get in the vicinity. Now, it's what I call a good trick with a capital G, capital T in Darwin's dangerous idea. Right. There are these. Good tricks of design, which are going to be discovered again and again and again, because they're simply they are the eternal good tricks. Arithmetic's one. Yeah. I think ethics now, is another. Now, that, now, what if, what if uh, somebody noted this by way of suggesting that that adds to the evidence that evolution had some purpose? If it naturally happens upon something that even you would agree is moral truth, okay? Natural selection produces is likely to produce a species that happens upon moral truth, doesn't that lend credence to the argument that maybe there was some point to the whole exercise? I don't think so. No. I was kind of thinking you might say that. <laughs> I don't no, know. Uh, it just happens. And we can explain why it happens. Um, does, uh, does death bother you? You, you, you? you said that one definition of a, of a bright, this, this, uh, this emerging interest group to which you yeah. proudly belong, um, is that they don't believe in life after death. Yeah. Is that... 
Would you rather there were life after death? No, I'd rather live to be a thousand. <laughs> but, but I. Um, uh, but then, if you died at a thousand, what would be your preferences for an afterlife? No, um, I think the concept of an afterlife is a is a very useful fantasy for handling the grief of small children and others, and I don't disparage it. I think it takes. It takes a very strong and brave person to to take on the task of comforting a, a child whose parent has just died, for instance. Um, and the consolation value of believing that mommy's up there watching you is is oh, boy, that's that's a that's a lifeboat in the storm if ever there was one. It is so transparently useful at times like that right. that um, I dare say that is enough to explain its popularity as an idea uh, for our species for all time. Yeah. The by the way, there is hope here. I'm gonna. Here's a quote from um, actually a book called Consciousness Explained, written by you. If what you are is the program that runs on your brain's computer, then you could in principle survive the death of your body as intact as a program can survive the destruction of a computer on which it was created and first run. Yeah, yeah. in fact, um, uh, my friend Marvin Minsky has uh, uh, invested, I think, a large part of his Japan prize in the uh, cryogenics contract of some sort so that his body, or at least his brain, can be can be kept in cold storage against some imagined future time when, uh, when, when he could be brought back to life so that he could enjoy the, you know, 25th century science or something like that. And I, I, I appreciate the motivation for this. I suppose if I had, had a few million to burn, I might, I might think of, of, of whether I might consider whether I would do that. The technology right now is nowhere near, uh, uh, and he knows that too. Uh, it's not. It's not in position now to to make that a very realistic uh, mm. project. So I think that it is just as likely that you could uh, store all the information in your body. I can store it on a hard disk and then build another one sometime in the future. Uh, fixing just the parts that need fixing, and that would be a way of bringing you back to life. Yeah, um, and as you may be alarmed to know, I don't know, but but an actual theologian um, that I interviewed, John Polkinghorne, used this very type of scenario to assert that it's possible uh -huh. to believe in an afterlife even now. In, in other words, granting that the physical body dies, but he's yeah. saying if the essence of the self is a configuration of information, yeah. then for all we know, you right, know, there's a non-supernatural way you can believe in the afterlife. Uh, that's the path to immortality, if that's what you really want. Oh, I definitely want it. Um, well, I think the technology is going to be too late for you and me. That's, but, but, um, that's what I fear. But uh, I was if teleportation is possible at all, then, then, then as it were, eternal life yeah. <laughs> is possible for the same reason. After all, the reason we die is that our parts break. Hmm. Well, if you get any insider information on this technology, you will drop me an email, won't you? Well, I don't know. You know, there may only be room for one or two of us in the, in no, the machine. No, information is actually very yeah, cheap to replicate. Yeah, yeah, right? but, but, uh, uh, but it's extracting the information from the body. That's well, the hard part. Yeah, well, yeah. I'll enjoy it then. Um, I guess we've covered enough. We've gotten... Uh, I've gotten all the way to death, and, and if that's not a natural place to stop, I don't know what it is. Mm -hmm. um, thanks a lot. This has been fun. It has been fun. Yeah, it's uh, uh, always a delight to see how you uh, Def defend indefensible de positions. How you defend indefensible positions? Well, what's interesting is that you and I are we we agree about so much. It, it's true. Uh, and then I see by my lights, I see you going along just. Beautifully, and then suddenly you oh, veer off to the side. And think, Wait a minute, where, where did that swerve come from? Yeah. Well, Must be free will. There's no accounting for human behavior, as, <laughs> as we know. Well, thanks a lot. Okay.